So, Russ, could you please walk me through your big picture macro view right now? I can gallop you through it, and it's it's it, it's a it's a very very confusing situation, and that much is obvious from the fact that even central bankers don't quite know what to do. You know, we've gone from being inflation to being transitory to being a challenge. We've gone for there being no recession to now the Fed's saying there's going to be a mild recession. So, you know, their crystal ball is cloudy, and I think it's fair to say that that mine is as well. Um, equally, I think, and, and we still got three outcomes possible. We could still get inflation. We could still get disinflation slash deflation, we could conceivably still get the worst of all worlds, which is stagflation, which is possibly, you could argue, what the UK is suffering right now with a series of GDP prints that begin naught point something with inflation at still north of 10%. Now, we're obviously hoping that that inflation figure will come down, and I think the maths will favour that, but you know, there is still a, le a legitimate case to be made for all three of those different scenarios, inflation, deflation, stagflation. And where do I think we'll end up? Personally, I, I still think that the chances on a recession are actually pretty high. I know that the Office for Budget Responsibility said it thinks we can dodge a technical recession. I know the Davos crowd have become a bit more positive. And although the IMF probably slightly trimmed its global GDP growth numbers, it still seems to think we can just about dodge a, a, a global recession. But if you look at a situation whereby we've had no real downturn barring the, the COVID lockdown inspired one that was short sharp we haven't really had a downturn for 15 years or so you know that's highly unusual how have central banks managed to keep the plate spinning when well, they've done it through cheap money through encouraging debt so you've effectively encouraging borrowing so you've effectively tried to solve what was a debt crisis by encouraging people to borrow more I i'm not sure that's a lasting solution if the truth be told and it, it may work so long as debt stays incredibly cheap but now that you know money is more expensive and debt are more expensive, I think there will be um, uh, an, an inevitable hit from that. And we have to bear in mind that monetary policy probably operates with a 12 to 18 month lag. We're 15 months into the UK raising interest rates and 12 months into America doing so, less for Europe. So we probably yet haven't seen the real impact of that monetary tightening. That will probably start to emerge in the next 12 to 18 months. Um, if you look at the US, you can argue that the strongest indicators are lagging, unemployment, jobs. The concurrent indicators, things like retail sales, housing sales, are starting to show signs of duress. And some of the leading indicators you would look at with it buried within the purchasing managers indices, hiring intentions, investment intentions, or job vacancies, they're starting to soften. So I think you can still make a strong case for a, a, a recession. And I think the strongest case for avoiding that rests on lagging indicators, which I'd be least keen to, to, to rely upon. And so I think base case, I think a recession is, is still distinctly possible. And I think that if you look at the history of central banks, they're only human. They're well-intended. They're smart, but they're only human. They will get things wrong. I don't think the Fed Reserve, Federal Reserve has ever accurately predicted a recession. And if you look at its history, generally speaking, the Fed has raised rates until something is broken either the economy or financial markets or both. And so I, I, arguing it's going to be different this time, I think is a pretty brave thing to do. And it takes you back to the old Rudy Dornbush quote, the US economics professor, you know, no American economic upturn died in its bed of old age. They were all murdered in their bed by the US Federal Reserve. Yeah, well, we definitely saw things breaking with Silicon Valley Bank. And obviously when I was doing my, my research yes. on you, saw that you were a managing director at UBS as well. So your your former firm has been busy, <laughs> to say the yes. least. I also saw... Yeah, no, I... I seen... Sorry, I also saw that um, you covered tech stocks as well as, a, as an analyst. So something arguably has broke. What's next to come? What could potentially break moving forward? There's lots of rumors about commercial real estate as a kind of cascading... Uh, you know, uh, warning signs. Um, yet, when you look at tech stocks, um, you know, given your background, we've got Google up, Apple up, you know, more double digits, Microsoft up 18%, Apple up 23%. So how do investors start to comprehend the weakening economic picture with a differing potentially market picture? 
Yeah, I think, first of all, we've got to be careful that financial markets and the economy aren't necessarily the same thing. You know, as, as we know, I mean, in theory, financial markets are forward-looking discounting mechanisms, particularly equities. Um, so they will they will move a lot, or they should move when they're working properly. They'll move a lot before the economy does. So the, the, the theory that you tend to see is what you're really looking at, and certainly, if, I guess, if you're a trader particularly, but even if you're in, in, an investor, um, is what you're looking at is a change in the rate of change, so the second derivative. So the market psychology will very much be, oh look, it's get you know it's getting worse, not good. Share price goes down. Oh, it's getting less, it's getting worse, but more slowly. And if it's getting worse more slowly, then it will eventually stop getting worse. And if it stops getting worse, then it will eventually start getting better. And so what markets will do is they'll try and preempt that getting better by moving in when things are getting bad but less quickly. And so that's when you'll tend to see cyclical stocks move, for example, our interest rate sensitives move because the market will start to discount central banks moving. And we may come back to this later, but you know, if you look at the US and UK two-year bond yields on government paper, treasuries in the US and gilts in the UK, they tend to move six months before the central banks do. Now, it's therefore desperately tempting to any for any libertarian or true free market believer to say, well, we can sack all the central bankers and get rid of all those expensive economists because they've never predicted in a recession in their life. And you can just rely on the two year yield to do everything for you and let the market price money properly. And it's desperately tempting. But you know, the history of markets being what it is, there's always going to be some wise person who'll try and fiddle the two year rate, just like they were allegedly fiddling LIBOR. So you can probably argue that you know, central banks are the, the, the least worst option that we have available to us. So markets will try and preempt that. So financial market is not just the economy, but I think where we've been with the financial markets in the last six months with, and this is equities as well as fixed income, is that certainly from that October rally onwards that we saw, markets were pricing in a cooling in inflation, a pause and then a pivot in central bank interest rates, with a result that we would then have a soft landing or indeed no landing at all economically. One, two, three. And I think the reason then that markets have probably become a little bit more challenged in the last month is that that reassuring narrative has been challenged. Inflation has been a bit sticky in the UK and even the core numbers in the US are still not coming down as fast as the Fed might like. And that's potentially put, you know, hopes, certainly initially there were hopes for a pivot in policy in July. Yeah, no, not, that's not quite so clear now. And now the Fed is saying, well, actually, there could be a mild recession after all, and maybe that's a price worth paying to get inflation down. So those three tenets have come under more duress recently, and that's why I think you've seen some of the sort of big rally that we saw from the autumn run out with a little bit of puff. As to why tech's going up, it's a really good one. You're right. I started actually as a fund manager in 1991. And I moved to the sell side as an investment analyst in investment bank in 93 and, and did techs. I, I wrote, so I saw tech go all the way up. The technology investment research team where I started initially had four people, peaked at 60 odd and then finished at about eight when I left. So you can see how the cycle uh, changes. And I think the reason that you're seeing tech coming back into fashion right now is A, um, I think that's fairly, you, you could argue it's fairly classic bear market stuff in that we've been conditioned to buy on the dips for the last 15 years. So it's, it's, a, it's a very hard habit to break because also it's been a successful strategy, generally speaking. B, I think that it, it's still unclear whether we are seeing a major shift economically from what we've been used to. In the last 15 years, we've had low growth, low rates, low inflation. It's not impossible we'll go back there. That disinflationary scenario we started, we talked about at the start. The IMF hinted as much in its paper this week in its, in its Washington meeting. And if you do go back to low growth, low rate, low inflation sludge, it's a perfect environment for long duration assets like tech, biotech and long dated government paper. Um, however, if the mood, if the environment really is going to change and we do see a return to the 1970s style environment of inflation or stagflation, it's an awful environment historically for long dated assets like long duration assets like tech, biotech and bonds. And then you need to be in short duration assets, cyclicals, real stuff, commodities. So I think at the moment, investors are still very much conditioned by what they've seen over the last 10 or 15 years, understandably so, because in some ways it's an environment 
They vote the only environment some of them have ever seen. But for all fossils like me who've been doing this for 30 odd years, who have seen different environments, um, I think if you do see a change, it would be in the backdrop, it would be unwise to assume that what's worked for the last 10 or 15 years will work again in the future because we may end up in a, in a, in a different environment. And at the moment, it feels like that's, that's maybe the case. So yes, I think a recession is possible. I think equally we could still get some stagflation and equally I think it may be that inflation for all the fact we get a slowdown proves a little bit more resilient than we than we than we hope at the moment I just want to pull on that a little bit more because you're obviously Mm. extremely experienced in that kind of tech space and you know maybe in the 2000s era etc it was very high growth maybe not too much cash flow generating assets whereas now the world's changed right tech dominates our, our world and what you're seeing, in my kind of opinion, is almost like a flight to safety, right? In those Microsofts, those Apples, they do produce cash flow. They are money-making machines. And actually, they've got, you know, secular tailwinds, plus maybe this overlay of AI. And maybe investors are, are kind of flocking to those uh, as a safe haven play. So how has your interpretation of tech stocks change throughout your career from when you covered them almost you know first uh to now has your view changed of them not as such because i think if you look at tech over time you know the one constant is change and so i think therefore it's it's very very you have to be careful to assume that the winners of today will be the winners of tomorrow and i I agree with you at the moment you know if you are looking for a haven things with net cash balance sheets with very powerful competitive positions are, are a good place to start because a powerful competitive position can give you pricing power, which at some of inflation helps to shield you. And you can argue that all of, um, you know, Apple, to a degree, you know, Meta, Alphabet, um, Amazon intra- has a powerful competitive position, but it's, it's having trouble monetizing it, though AWS is, is, a, is a money-making machine. Um, Microsoft, those, those are incredibly powerful franchises with to a degree captive customer bases who are are locked in because they know the operating system, they like it, they don't want to change and and adopt a different one. Uh, And so I can see why they are treated as havens for sure. I think the danger that you have there is that even disruptors can be disrupted. I mean, remember Apple did have a near death experience under John Scully and it took Steve Jobs to come back and, and, and dig it out of trouble. Microsoft has successfully reinvented itself once, whether it can do it and it's, you know, it's been a phenomenal success. Amazon's core business is challenged at the moment because it's just it's 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 not making any money it's not making any money on on, on delivery and, and and retail so I wouldn't want to rely on all of them implicitly and if you look at the history of tech over time yes we started off you know with if you look at previous tech booms whether it's gosh if you go all the way back you know pocket calculators was a was a big boom for for tech and and semiconductor stocks in the early 1970s then you had you know, mini computers and microcomputers, then you had desktops, uh, then you had mainframes, then you had desktop, or you had mainframes, then mini computers, then desktops, then smartphones. These things come and go, and there's always something else coming up along the pipe. And AI may indeed be a fantastic thing, but it is also a potential challenge, I would suspect, if you're, you know, Alphabet with the, the Google utility of search, which it is, it's a phenomenal tool, but it could be a challenge to that as well as an opportunity. So I, again, I think my... My my one caveat with tech is you wouldn't want to rely on it implicitly, or at least pay too high a price for it. And I think again that's something that we is it something that we're finding out. You know we we did find out is that you know when Apple's market cap is now back to I think two and a half trillion dollars, but it peaked at three, and a lot of these stocks they're still doing great things. And but the price that was paid for them during lockdown probably assumed that the growth rate they were generating then would be sustainable, which I don't think is proven to be the case. And that has challenged their valuations, particularly when interest rates have gone up. Now, if rates go down, that will also help tech stocks because they're priced ultimately on a discounted cash flow valuation and their cash flows tend to be quite back end loaded, certainly for some of the newbies that are up and coming. So the higher the interest rate, the higher the discount rate, the lower the net present value of the cash flow, the lower the theoretical value of the equity. But that could work the other way if interest rates start going down. But I would suspect that from my perspective on tech is, yes, great companies, but don't assume that they will be great forever or at least don't pay any price for them. And I'll be slightly concerned. And I haven't been able to verify this, by the way, Eddie. So, But I've, I've read numbers that suggest that about 90 percent 
of the upside we saw from the S&P 500 and US stocks in the first quarter of the year came from a very small handful of stocks. Now, again, I can see why they have haven appeal, net cash, competitive positions, tech worked brilliantly, but that's all very reminiscent of the nifty 50 mentality that we saw in the in the in the early 1970s when there were 50 stocks that just dominated and said, well if you own those 50 what can go wrong well if you if you overpay for them everything and of those 50 stocks from then there's barely a handful that even exist today let alone thrive so again i think you've got to be careful in your assumption that because they're dominant now they'll be dominant forever and, and if you look at what do, what does a company in what it's either they do something egregious because they get lazy and they annoy the customers. And you could argue that going back to the Cambridge Analytica scandal, maybe that's what started to unseat what is now Meta Platforms come Facebook as it was. Competition ships in. Well, there's no short. If people are making good money, then somebody's going to try and have a crack at you somewhere. Or the regulator gets involved and gets annoyed with you. And you can argue that big tech to varying degrees does face all three of those things. So again, I wouldn't want to presume forever that they can be top dog. And if you look right now at Apple, Foxconn's just slipped out a profit warning. The chip stocks are knocking out profit warnings. TSMC just had its worst its worst month. The world's leading semiconductor foundry had its worst month for sales since May 2019. So there are signs that the supply chain, yes, it's unblocking, but it's unblocking because supply has ramped up at a time when demand has started to ease, either because lockdown pulled it forward or because the consumers under duress or whatever it happens to be. So even then, I wouldn't want to take too much for granted, even in the short term, long run at the moment, phenomenal companies, but don't pay any price for them and assume they're invincible because unsinkable sounds too much like uh, invincible sounds too much like unsinkable, said the Hindenburg to the Titanic. Yeah, it'll be super interesting. To be careful of valuation. <laughs> it'll be super interesting to see earnings season. And obviously, the outlook for rates yeah. arguably is less high than it has been maybe rate cuts maybe at the end of this year or in, into next year but the econ- yeah and the economy will challenge potentially those earnings like we saw with apple 40 negative 40 percent on their pc sales for example so these companies are not immune yep. to the economic cycle uh, although they are you know cash cash flow generating machines but the impression that i get for you is that now we're in an environment with viable alternatives Right, and that could be fixed income, even much short short duration money market funds. I've obviously seen massive flows. Gold with yep. potentially the U.S. dollar debasing or at least declining this year after a strong year uh, last year. But we are entering this recession. So, what does your kind of recession playbook look like now and for the rest of the year? How should investors be thinking about? a diversified portfolio and what looks attractive to you now um, yeah, and could I, I, do I, I, depending on what yeah, I mean, you I think, see. I mean, I always, I mean, valuation is, is the greatest tool. And it, it, well, the one thing that grant valuation doesn't do is time. Doesn't time markets. Once, once, you know, I saw it with tech stocks in 1998. You know, the, the team I was working with put out a big thing in mid-99 saying, this is nuts. The market's lost its mind. You're going to have to be really, really careful here. The Nasdaq went up by another 50%. So we nearly all got ourselves fired because we were out there saying this is all rubbish. And our investment bankers were saying, we're missing out on all these deals. Look at all these paydays. Duh. And we were saying, well, they're all going to be trashed. They're all going to be worth zero in three years' time. <laughs> so it's all a matter of timing, right? It's like Mike Burry in the film The Big Short. You know, his clients are pulling their money out saying, well, you're wrong the US housing market isn't going to collapse. And he's saying, I'm not wrong, I'm just early. And it turned out he was two years early. So, you know, it, again, it's all in, there's an element of it all being in the timing, right? But so valuation is not a timing tool. I can stand I can stand outside my house and jump up and down till I'm blue in the face and argue that something's expensive, but it won't stop it getting more expensive if the market's got the bit between its teeth and something doesn't change to change perception. So I think that's the, the first thing. But what I would say is that valuation will always protect you in the end from overpaying and getting sucked in. And it will always give you a chance to protect yourself on the way down and then make money on the way up. But it's it's never going to help you with the timing, but it will help protect you through the more volatile times and give you opportunities. If you're looking at what's expensive right on the face of it, as we've kind of touched upon on the face of it, virtually any way you slice them, U.S. equities look quote expensive. As a percentage of global market cap, they're up at 60%. 
That's exactly where they peaked in 2000. Market capture GDP, the buffer indicator, historic highs. Professor Robert Schiller's cyclically adjusted price earnings. Not at its all time high, but above 30. It's only been there two or three times before. It didn't end well, but you don't know when or why. So on the face of it, US is, is tricky. The UK on the face of it looks terribly cheap. But equally, you can say, well, of course it deserves to be cheap. It's packed full of this 20th century rubbish, oil, miners, banks, insurers. It's a matter of, you know, the unforecastable, the indigestible, and you can argue the interminably slow consumer staples. But that's a mix that actually might look quite good in an inflationary environment. Doesn't look good in a low growth, low rate, low duration one like the US, but in a different environment, the UK actually might have the right sort of tools to help protect you from that. So a lot of it will depend upon your worldview and the same for emerging markets. So you know, if you think that we're going back to low growth, low rates, low inflation, by all means, bonds will be potentially very interesting right now, uh, particularly short duration. If you can lock in 4% on the US two-year, that might look really quite interesting, if that's your worldview. If your worldview is that we are going to get inflation or stagflation, then they're going to be potentially more challenged. Then you're looking at more commodity exposed or more short cycle business areas like emerging markets or the UK, for example, or to a degree Germany, uh, Europe, packed with banks, packed with high quality cyclicals. So a lot of that will depend upon your worldview. And then sector wise, in the UK, for example, banks terribly cheap. Again, you can say, well, they, don't, they deserve to be. We've just had a run on US banks. We've had a major Swiss bank fall into the arms of its bitterest rival. We've got a recession coming. Don't they deserve to be cheap? Answer probably, but then they already are. So to what degree is that bad news already priced in? And I think the real interesting test for the UK, I mean, economically, but also from a market perspective, is watch the house builders. Because if there are rate cuts coming, you would expect the house builders to start to sniff that really pretty quickly. And it's in just looking at my screen over there, they're actually having a really good day today, which is why I, I particularly mention it. Um, in that, again, the UK two year will move before the Bank of England does. The house builders will to a degree feed off that. And they've gone from trading at a big premium to book value to inline or discounts with the odd exception. And the old bank rule of thumb on the house builders is one times book and below they're cheap, two times book and above they're expensive. Then it's just a matter of waiting for something to change. Um, and they've derated massively back to one times book or below. And if you do sense there's a, a rate cut coming as things tip into recession, the builders will probably, if you look at the say an example of the 1990 to 92 cycle, yes, nasty recession, builders, th share prices thrive through that because they smelled interest rate cuts coming. And when the rate cuts came, then they really got motoring. So again, the builders won't wait for signs of improved mortgage applications and improved sales and improved profits. They'll have moved a long way before then. So they could be a really interesting litmus test UK economy and, and where rates are going at the moment, they look pretty cheap and they've got net cash balance sheets, whereas 2000, they've got four billion pounds of net cash between them right now, the quoted builders, 2007, they had four billion pounds of net debt. So again, they've got some ballast to see them through any downturn that's coming. Right, that's, that's really interesting because yeah, well, you're looking at maybe domestic property. What about commercial property? Um, and obviously we've discussed UBS yeah. credits with some breakages there, lots of regional banks in the U S, um, which were obviously the, the root of the problem have a lot of commercial real estate exposure, uh, very interest rate sensitive, for example. So my question is, what does that look like in terms of the ripple effects, um, in the UK, in Europe, is that a challenge? Um, what does this mean for not only the banks, but maybe the non-bank lenders? Is there any challenges or things that you could see happen for the rest of this year or beyond that would keep you up at night? <laughs> I, I, somebody who started his career in a bear market, I always think from 1991 to 93, I'm always going to slightly come at things from the dark side because my first 18 months as a junior fund manager was spent protecting the downside. And so that's, so it was probably a bit unfortunate I was then got given tech because it's obviously that's a very much more of a blue sky upside kind of oriented type of thing. Uh, but I was, I was a trend by a value house during a, during a bear market. So I'm always going to be of sort of downside protection first uh, angle. Um, commercial, well, first of all, in terms of the banking wobble, I mean, it has been contained so far to th 
the three or four banks in the US and, and one badly run Swiss institution that had let itself down over a multiple period of time. And I'm not saying that just because I used to work for, 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 for UBS. Um, I, I, it's interesting that some of the narrative has now moved on to blaming social media for those US bank runs and, and technology just because it made it easy for people to get the information and move their money around. And I guess it's nobody wants to be, you've got to be careful if you're sitting in a darkened cinema, the one thing you don't want to hear is somebody shouting fire, right? Because you're automatically going to head for the exits and take your chances later. So that's kind of what happened with Silicon Valley Bank was there was a big shout of fire and everybody legged it. And that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, particularly with a badly run bank, where there were a lot of uninsured deposits, where there was a lot of excess liquidity, which had been pumped in largely by central banks, you could say, and where risk controls were poor. Um, and I think that the, with all of the institutions so far, it's been, in the American case, a surfeit of liquidity, lacks supervision and regulation, and very, very weak, and then the surfeit of liquidity provided by, by by central banks, which then ran the other way. In terms of the UK, I think our regulation is tighter. I think that there hasn't been that degree of surfeit of liquidity that we saw at those specific niche banks. Um, and so, at the moment, at least, I think the UK regulation is is hanging in there pretty well. And again. Also, the UK banks don't trade at a premium to book value from a stock market perspective in the way that the American ones except Citigroup do. So again, I think you've got more downside protection in terms of valuation there as well as regulation and risk controls relative to those uh, US institutions that, that went belly up. Having said that, I think that there is a potential knock-on effect economically from those failures because I think you know, chief credit officers and senior loan officers will be a little bit more risk averse than they were previously. And if they see deposits leaking out the door, then that does limit a bank's opportunity to, to lend and, and ability to let and willingness to lend. So I think there is a danger that, which is why I'm, I still think there is a recession risk probably underappreciated because I think there could be knock on effects there. Commercial, commercial real estate is really tricky because, you know, if, if you look, I mean, first of all, it's not homogenous. So if you look, just look at the UK as an example, looking at the REITs, Real Estate Investment Trust that we have here in the UK, you have some that are exposed to city skyscrapers, some that are retail and retail parks, some that are uh, data, data centers and servers, some that are healthcare institutions, some that are domestic property, you know, commercial, residential property, some that are warehousing logistics, so that, that, some are, and some are self-storage. So you've got very, very disparate sector um, and they trade at different multiples of book value. Generally speaking, over time, what you've seen is those that are the furthest away from big city skyscrapers um, trade at the biggest discount, to, uh, trade at the higher premium. So data centers and servers have probably been, and warehousing logistics have been the highest valued relative to book value. The lowest valuations have been probably um, things like you know big city skyscrapers so british land and land securities and commercial property whereas the big premier of with, with and then with healthcare somewhere in the middle um so again the, the reits trade at some very big discounts to book value now particularly in the areas that you've just touched upon like commercial i mean i probably now work in the office two or three days a week but i'm sat at home right now as you can tell from the bookcase behind me um and i don't think that there will be a monster dash back to the office, even though JP Morgan is now apparently telling all of its senior executives to get their backsides in there five days a week. So I think in that respect, there will be a constraint on demand for commercial real estate, for example. Equally, if you look at Great Portland Estates this week, you know, rents are still very strong. It's just had a record year for rents. And so I think it's a bifurcated market in that new modern buildings, lots of light, lots of air, lots of ventilation, gyms, nice cafes, da da pop, da 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 still very much in demand. Older buildings that don't offer those, not quite so much. And so again, if you look at what Land Second British Land are doing, they're busy recycling their assets as best they can and developing a new one. So they might not be quite as heavily hit as everybody might think. But yeah, in the event of a recession, things will clearly get harder and they will they will see some increase in voids and, and, and increase in, in, in non-rental payment. But at the moment at least, rental income looks okay. And they're terribly cheap. So they were really, really if anything, on the, from an investment point of view, they're almost in the too hard pile. Terribly cheap, no immediate positive catalyst, lots of economic cross currents. Um, real contrarians might be tempted, but I, I think for a lot of people, they're probably still too early. But I think in the US, again, the regional bank exposure to commercial real estate is definitely something that we need to keep a close eye on. 
particularly there's a big wave of refis due by 2024, 2025. It's not far away. And again, I think it's another reason why I'd be a little bit wary of the optimism that still seems to pervade the US equity market particularly. Yeah, isn't it funny that off offices, office blocks make up the most the majority of most REITs, commercial REITs, because they were thought to be the safest, you know, form of, of commercial real estate. And now, you know, the tide's turned and the world's changed. And now it's all about data centers. And I think uh, Blackstone just uh, raised a $30 billion fund to pursue these opportunities in, you know, uh, lab offices, uh, health, healthcare data centers. So there are opportunities. Um, for those, obviously, retail investors can't necessarily, um, you know, get direct exposure to that very easily. Um, but there's lots of opportunities within this kind of recession playbook. Yeah. There was one. You just have to find a specialist fund. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There, there was one uh, brilliant uh, article that I, I read of yours, which was about bubbles. And that's what I'd like to kind of end <laughs> uh, the article, yeah. uh, the, the podcast on. Bubbles may change, but their evolution stayed fairly consistent. <laughs> so what are the signs? Uh, arguably, we had in 2021 the big re-rating of softwares, you know, SaaS companies, tech companies. Obviously, last year was very much a bad year for bonds. Obviously, the 60-40 portfolio had its worst year, I think, since 1930s. So what bubble elements do you see now, and what are the signs of any that you see right now? I think we've probably seen a, a rolling deflation or bursting of bubbles, if anything, which is actually quite a, quite a healthy thing. Um, so if you look, since we've really had what well, interest rate increases starting 15 months ago, we've had I mean, cryptocurrencies. All right, I know Bitcoin's back above 30 now, and it's actually having a ripping run, which I'm still trying to slightly under, understand because I'm not naturally a crypto person anyway, being of a certain certain vintage. But Crypto, lots of cryptocurrencies have fallen to earth hard and are not coming back and non-fungible tokens the same. Initial public offerings have cooled. Meme stocks have you know, largely come down, albeit with some, some extremely violent rallies. Uh, SPAC, special purpose acquisition companies, that fad seems to have come and gone. Gilts and bonds, as you say, had a blow up and particularly the UK gilt had a massive blow up last autumn thanks to Trustonomics and, and Quartonomics. And then we've seen you know, banking stocks. You've had this rolling ripple effect of, of things that have done incredibly well starting to, to, to go wrong and derate and, and 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 having offered a lot of financial gain now offer a lot of financial pain um and so i think that's although it's not pleasant for anybody who's got money involved there it's actually probably quite healthy in that money now has a real opportunity cost again you know uk, UK base rates are four and change the federal funds rate is a five percent find the right tool you can get four or five percent for doing nothing all right, inflation you now have to, then has to be taken into account. But I think that will persuade people to be a little bit more aware of the fact there is an opportunity cost to money. When money has no opportunity cost, you'll be pretty free and easy about it and potentially do dangerous, silly things with it. I think that's largely what we've seen. So if you look at a classic bubble cycle, well, yeah, you, ha you do have a genuine innovation, a genuine disruption that appears. And this is, there are loads of brilliant books on bubbles. I use the Kindleberger model from Manius Panics and Crashes. But Edward Chancellor wrote a terrific book called Devil um, Take the Hindmost. Uh, Professor John Turner's written a really good book on them uh, from Queen's University Belfast quite recently. And Richard Buxtaber's book, Demon of Our Own Design, is a terrific history of financial crises and their origins. And the reason that we still get crises is that, yes, regulation changes and circumstances change, but human behavior doesn't. And ultimately, that's what it's all about. You can try and regulate human behavior until you're blue in the face. People will get excited and get greedy and then they'll get frightened and they'll get scared and that prompts the buying and that prompts the selling and that's that. So the classic cycle is, yes, you get a disruptive innovation that is genuinely really exciting. Whether it's canals, railways, Latin American mines, technology, property, you know, exotic derivatives on property and mortgages, whatever that happens to be. And that initially goes really well because it does what it does. It disrupts and it creates productivity and it breeds success and then you get share prices going up and then more people pile in because they're miss frightened of missing out and then you get the copycats appearing more credits thrown at it everything keeps on going up and then the first stumble is well the insiders start selling there's a rash of ipos then there's a rash of secondary offerings management teams start unloading stock which you definitely did see by the way quite a lot in the us particularly in 2020 2021 2022 and that starts the first oh what am I missing? And the answer is, well, actually nothing because I'm going to buy another dip because that's what's worked brilliantly for so long on why wouldn't I? 
and then you get more IPOs and more secondary offerings and more management sellings and then something goes wrong. There's an IPO that goes thud or whatever it happens to be. And that's when the mentality changes from buying the dips to sell into the rallies. And a really good fund manager, hedge fund management client of mine in Boston, when I was at the bank, he always used to say he was always very wary of shorting cult stocks until they'd halved. He says once they halve, then buy on the dip becomes sell on the rally. Psychologically speaking, people start the wet towels start to come slopping into the ring, and that's when the bubble really starts to lose air. And then the final stage is normally a whacking great scandal of some kind or other, where people really feel, oh, I've been taken for a bit of a mug here, um, and then okay, I'm out, I'm done. And so that's kind of five or six stages now. I think in some cases, we've probably been right around that cycle and we're going back to the start. I think in some cases, we're probably still somewhere near the top. And in some cases, we're probably quite near the scandal. For, so I think in those, that kind of rolling bubble thing that we've had, I think we're, we're in different stages. We're in different, different stages. But investors, at least then, have got a framework for feeling what they think might be. Because in the end, the buying opportunities, when there's revulsion, people have given up. It's like, oh, I've been... and and. So long as there's a genuine investment, a genuine asset in there, which you, there'll always be a nugget of them somewhere, that's potentially really, really interesting, as proved to be the case in tech. You know, tech did everything and more that was expected of it in that 2000 to 2003 bubble, just didn't do it as quickly as people hoped, and the prices that were built in were unsustainable in the short term. So again, valuation was your guide that there was danger here, but in 2003, if you bought then, you had to be very patient. Tech didn't really start moving until 2006, six seven, And in the end, if you bought in 2003, you didn't get your money back on the NASDAQ until 2013. But once it turns, it can it can really turn. So I think there there are, there's lots of things I've seen in the last three years that remind me very much of 98 to 2000 and a lot of this Kindleberger stuff. Some of it is still potentially looking pretty bubbly. Some of it's gone wrong. Some of it's going wrong. It's But it's a really, really useful framework. Yeah, and it's a perfect segue. I love that line about human psychology doesn't change. So to end this podcast, for all our listeners, given that we've been through that bubble over the last three years and we're heading maybe to the start of a new cycle, a new uh, potentially uh, period with a new investment regime where tech stocks won't do amazingly well, potentially or long-term capital market assumptions aren't as high and there's other alternatives what should retail investors have in mind in terms of their psychology with their portfolios, with their investing for this year, which is likely to be very volatile, as we've seen already? Yeah, I, I think it is. Keep an open mind. I think it was Frank Zappa who said that the mind is like a parachute, works best when open. And I think it's just don't assume that we're going back to low growth, low rate, low inflation sludge. And, I th and, and don't assume that central banks are going to get it right. They'll, they'll try, but policy error is in many ways the, the investor's biggest enemy. Um, and I think the one thing that could trip central bankers up this year is oil. Because in the end, if you look at the inflation deceleration we've had so far, much of it is energy and gasoline at the, at the pumps. So OPEC has just you know, given that one a bit of a tug with its, with its production cut and get crude has popped back up again. So if you suddenly saw for any reason crude oil back at 100 bucks or more or back to its peaks last year of 120, that will be a, a thoroughly unpleasant situation for central bankers because they can't print oil to depress the price. The Americans have just said they want to start replenishing their strategic petroleum reserve. You know, China is still reopening. We still aren't drilling for oil because we, you know, we, we ecologically, we, it, there's, it's, it's seen to be a bad thing. And, is, uh, and there's pressure on drillers not to drill from their banks, their insurers, their shareholders, the public and politicians. And so understandably, they're keeping drilling pre pretty tight. So if there's a nasty surprise this year, it will be it could be oil because we've seen it dribble. We've seen it come back a long way. And we've got government support schemes that are still running, but are due to expire. So if there's a nasty surprise, that's it. A good surprise, therefore, would be oil, you know, staying at $80 and or going below or even going back to 60, 70. That would be a huge help to everybody. But if we did get inflation, then you'd need then you know having a balance of for all the scenarios is probably an interesting way of thinking about it because historically inflation has been good for cyclical short duration assets, commodities and hard stuff. Disinflation, low inflation, good for a deflation, good for paper assets, cash, bonds, long duration assets, tech and anything that's got growth. 
stagflation, worst of all worlds. We've only had one example in the 1970s. What did then well? What we did well then? Defense stocks, consumer staples, anything you put down your throat or the sink because they've got pricing power, uh, and, and gold. So, and I think gold probably isn't the inflation hedge as such because it 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 it's it probably more a loss of faith in policymakers, loss of control, which is what you saw in the late 70s, what you saw in the 2000s. Central bankers were behind the curve, and I think there's that slight sense they are now, and that's why gold's gone back above 2000. So three scenarios, three, if this was in a guide, portfolio solutions, probably therefore having a bit of a mix of all three might be a way of protecting yourself. And But I think ultimately, just because something's worked well for the last 10 years, don't assume it's going to work well for the next 10 because history would suggest that actually that's not going to happen. Yeah, and I think that's a brilliant way to end this. So, Russ, thank you for an absolute masterclass. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much, and I'm sure our listeners will get a huge amount of value from this. Um, if they, if anyone wants to find you, what's the best place? Twitter, LinkedIn? I'm on both, so they're quite happy to, to hunt me down there. I, I would just say... Just having had an email from my IT security people, there are some WhatsApp channels out there that are bearing my name that are not me, and they're giving investment advice. Now, AJ Bell is not authorized to give investment advice, so anywhere the way you see me giving investment advice on the internet, I will promise you for free, it's not me, and it's nothing to do with AJ Bell either, so please be careful. Yeah, had a few of those on my LinkedIn inviting people to telegrams. I will never open a telegram channel. Just putting it out there. So there we go. Yeah, I've had a couple good, of those as well. Good, good, a good warning there. So yeah, Russ, thank you very much, and I'll see you next time. Pleasure. I look forward to it.